lecture, we have Jeremy Hanks with us. Uh, we had a little bit of a technical problem, but we've resolved that now, and so he'll start in just a minute. Uh, the only announcement I have is that there are so many of you that have some conflicts, legitimate conflicts with basketball uh, games or whatever, so we've, we've added one makeup lecture on a Tuesday night. Uh, you have to come to nine lectures to pass the class, nine out of 10. We've added one on Tuesday, February 3rd, on a Tuesday night, so if you have to miss for a legitimate reason, you could come to that lecture and still easily get your nine lectures. And we will send more information about that out through Canvas, so you'll know exactly where it is, and when it is, and what will happen that night, all right? So let's go ahead. Madeline has been our host for uh, Mr. Hanks, and she's going to introduce Jeremy, and we'll go ahead and start. All right. So I've had the pleasure of spending the last few hours with Jeremy, and um, we, talk, we talked a little bit about, you know, entrepreneurs are people who see problems and solve them, but they have to be willing to take on risk, right? And even if you're afraid, you take on risk. And I think he's the perfect person to kick off, to kick off this lecture series because he's really exemplified that, not just in his business career that he'll talk about tonight, but he is quite the adventurer. Um, he was just telling us a story at dinner about how um, he was mountaineering and almost got killed by a boulder and ended up tearing his ACL. He came away with, I guess, minor battle scars in the scheme of things. But um, I just think we can learn a lot from not only the things he says, but just his personality and you know what it really means to be an entrepreneur tonight. Um, and with that, I'll just let him get right to it. He's great. So thanks, Jeremy, for coming. And um, we're excited to learn from you tonight. Thank you. Um, sorry about the technical stuff. And I just realized, can I get on audio? I have a video at some point if we plug in. You know, um, and then we'll need to, I'll, you know, so. Uh, so it'll, it'll be probably ironic when, you know, I talk for the last part of, of tonight uh, around technology and the speed of technical, technological change and how awesome that is. And then, you know, we can't get PowerPoint to work and, and things. So um, technology is a, is a love-hate relationship for me and probably maybe for a lot of you. Um, but I, I'm excited. I, uh, I, I, thanks thanks for, to, to Mike for inviting me to come up and talk. Um, I, I've come up to Utah State once before, and, and I really like coming up here. I, I joke with people that on the freeway you pass the sign that says, you know, you know welcome to the Arctic Circle. But uh, <laughs> it can get cold up here, right? You get that cold air, it comes down the valley, and it's like 300 degrees below zero. And, um, <laughs> but it's nice. Somebody told me, like, oh, you're going up there. You're going to have the bad inversion. It, the air is way better up here than it is down in Utah County right now. So. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about my story, um, not too much of a life story, but I think it's important to know a little bit about kind of, you know, where I came from and, and, and kind of what I've been doing for the last 15, 16 years of my life, um, where I consider myself to be an entrepreneur. And then try to, you know, just tell you a little bit about how exciting I think it is to live in today's world and to maybe be an entrepreneur. And then we'll do some questions and eat ice cream and have a good party. So, um, you know, this is a, a satellite picture of, uh, of my dad's farm. And my mom and dad came, you know, to, to see. They're from Burley, Idaho. So they uh, not too far a drive. It's a, I've spoken at colleges probably, I don't know, 10, 15 times. And it's always like, oh, it's too, it's too far. No, I've given them a hard time. Um, I probably just never tell them. Uh, a, I think it's incredibly awesome that I can go and in 30 seconds be on Google and have a picture of where I grew up. Um, that kind of blows my mind, first of all, but, but that's, that's, uh, that's our farm. Um, so I grew up on a dairy farm, and it wasn't just a dairy farm. My, my, my dad and his brothers also uh, grew sugar beets. Um, and growing up, one of the things that we you know, had to do was to hoe the sugar beets. Has anybody hoed sugar beets before in this room? A few? Is it, is it fun? It's hot. You walk up and down these rows. They feel endless. And you, you basically chop out the weeds. You actually have to thin sugar beets, too. That's a whole other. But 
um, you know, you, you have a hoe and you go. And I, I think, you know, my mom and dad just thought that, you know, having kids, we had five kids, it's just, it's kind of like uh, forced labor, you know, indentured <laughs> servitude. You know, somebody's got to hoe the beats. That's, that's uh, our family. And maybe we'd round up our friends from the city. I, you know, Burley's about 8,000 people. And, you know, I call them city slickers, you know, because we're in the country. And they would come out, and I think it was my friend Nate Jensen. He made it like a day, and he's like, I'm out of here, man. This sucks. Um, and I think, I don't know why, but I always just complained a lot. And um, I'm a complainer. I mean, we can, my, my wife is here as well, and probably my kids. And, you know, I just complain, but I always have, a, it's, it's not empty complaints. I always have, a, have, a, have an answer. So um, it's hard to see here. I tried to lighten, but but that that's a be that's my dad, um, when he's a young young buck, and a lot of weeds. That's like, and then that's the same. You know, I don't know if you can tell the contrast. Like lots of weeds, no weeds. And it's like hundreds of hours of work to chop out all those damn weeds. Um, <laughs> and I used to talk about we could invent a robot, right? You know, and migrant laborers. You know, this was you know th th this is a manual thing. These these sugar beets. These sugar beets are almost. 20% of the world's sugar. Uh, the rest is mostly sugar, sugar cane. Um, and there's a lot of sugar beets, Southern Idaho, Eastern Oregon. Um, you know, there's a sugar beet field. And so in my head, I would talk about a robot, right? That was my, I'm gonna, I, I would say, I wanna be an inventor, because someday I'm gonna invent a robot so I don't have to hoe these stupid beets. This is the Atlas robot, anybody know that? Boston Dynamics, Google bought them and like 25 other robotics companies last year. I'm not entirely sure how that helps them organize the world's information, but that's a different conversation. So I pictured, I don't know, maybe this Atlas robot like hoeing sugar beets, right? <laughs> awesome, right? Um, that didn't happen. That's a picture of a sugar beet field today. No one's weeded that field. Um, why aren't there any weeds? Does anybody know? Yeah. Who said Monsanto? What, is, what did Monsanto do? Yeah. Yeah. Way, and whether you think this is good or not, that, you know, Roundup, which is a, a pest, a, not pesticide, herbis, herbicide that kills any living plant, basically, really well. Um, they figured out how that they could make sugar beet seeds that then wouldn't die when you sprayed them with Roundup. So when the farmers plant the sugar beet fields now, the weeds keep growing, they just come and spray everything and the, wheat, the, beet, the beets are like, eh, whatever, and the weeds die. Um, so, you know, invention, creation, solving problems. Somebody solved the problem. It wasn't a robot. I wish it was a robot, right? Like, come on, I mean, this is cool, a genetical engineering, but can you picture armies of Atlas robots with those hoes out? That would, that'd be pretty awesome. Um, so I start on a farm, and you know, I've, I've now spent 16 years of my life across three startups. And my current startup, I want to now jump forward a little bit and tell you the problem that we're trying to solve, and then jump back and tell you how I got there from, from farm. Um, so inside of retail, there's a, this global inventory distortion problem. Um, and you know, I, I'm gonna, I don't know how much you know, knowledge around, you know, supply chain stuff. So, you know, ask me after in the Q&A if I, if I talk too, too specific. Um, but, but the way to think about it is at any given time, there's $1.5 trillion of product, of inventory, that is sitting in an overstock position. And what that means is a retailer has purchased this product to sell to all of us, and they made one and a half trillion dollars of wrong decisions, and they're, they bought too much stuff, too much supply, it's overstocked. Um, each year, economically, that's about 300, you know, it's over 300 billion dollars of, of economic losses. Um, kind of compounding the problem, there's, a, there's a, the, the other side of the coin to uh, overstocked inventory is out of stock. Have you ever gone to a retailer store knowing what you wanted and, you, and just wasn't there on the shelf? Um, so that's a situation where there's no supply for your demand, and that's another $450 billion of economic losses. Uh, you put them all together, you know, you're, you're approaching a, a trillion dollars in the world of retail and, and consumer. And you remember, retail is about 65, 70% of the U.S. economy. 
and, uh, and most major you know, countries' economies and in the emerging world that's moving in that direction. So these are, these are really big numbers caused by this inventory being in the right place or the wrong place or too much of it or not enough of it. Um, and it's, the ec economists are tracking it seems to be growing, getting worse, mostly because of the emerging economies. You know, the, the middle class in China and India, they're, they're becoming more consumption driven and so it's, it's making this problem go. It's like, real quick, why does this happen? So, got my laser pointer. The world generally has worked for a long time, a thousand years. You know, there are companies who make things, you know, merchants and retailers, sellers who sell things and all of us <coughs> who buy things. And there's usually kind of a, a line right here. You know, supplier makes it, retailer buys it, and then they stock it. And that's this business to business transaction, wholesale. Don't, Costco is not wholesale, it's a lie. Don't believe them. Um, wholesale, right? Wholesale, because they're gonna resell it. So then it's in their, now it's in their stock. A consumer comes to some point of sale purchase, which has generally historically been a store, a storefront, and they purchase the product. You know, so B to B, B to C. That's how the world works. Make the product, sell it to the people who sell the product, they sell it to the people who consume the product. Um, E-commerce, 22 years ago, kind of says, just kidding, not gonna work that way anymore. Um, because now a consumer can become virtual. He's no longer, he or she is no longer constrained by, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna drive to Boulder, Colorado to buy my backpack, right, you know? But I can go to um, rai.com and you know, from anywhere on the planet with an internet connection. So I, have, as a consumer, have kind of become virtualized. Um, and the storefront, right? The storefront is now REI.com versus REI in Salt Lake City. So there's this, this shift. It's still predominantly, the last 22 years, most of the world is, B to, is, is still B2B, B2C. It's just the B2C is starting to change. Uh, back up real quick. 90% of the world in the United States on average is still this flow. It's physical, business to business supply chain and physical consumers walking into physical stores. So Amazon and everything you hear, that's 10% of the world. As much as we hear about it, it's still 90% of the world happens no different than it would have happened 40 years ago. So, but it's changing, it's changing quickly. And the minute this started to happen, you know, smart people, economists, everybody said, wait a minute, if we can virtualize consumers and take away their geographic constraint, and we can virtualize storefronts and take away their physical constraint, you know, no, no more buildings and walls and shops, what would happen if we could actually kind of kick it back upstream? And that's, you know, drop shipping and, and marketplace and, and other terms you may hear and that I'll talk about when I talk about what I do at Dropship Commerce, um, is just really pushing it further back up. So now the inventory, the products that you buy, they don't move physically into a, a stock room of a retailer. That becomes a virtual stock room as well. Um, so go to Costco.com. There are a lot of products there that says available online only. And what that means is that Costco will never see or touch that in any of their warehouse stores, any of their distribution centers. That product lives with who made it. Costco virtually has it in their stock room, virtually in their Costco.com point of sale, and I'm a virtual consumer, and I, it's all virtual until it becomes a real transaction, and then this person puts it in a box and ships it to the consumer. So you're, you've pushed virtualization back up the supply chain, and really, you line them together, you know, the, the ones and zeros in the blue, it's this process of virtualization. It's not unique to the retail supply chain, Music used to be physical, right? It used to be records and eight tracks and tapes and CDs, and now it's all virtual. So virtualization is being driven by technology, it's being driven by the internet, and it's impacting the supply chain. So I, I kind of wonder, and maybe so that my presentation goes better, I hope that you're kind of thinking to yourself, how in the world did this dairy farm person go from that you know, 20 years ago to maybe talking some things that sound pretty complicated around the retail supply chain. I don't know. I, I actually don't know the answer either. But I do know a lot about this. I, I, I've helped write a book about this. I speak at conferences. I kind of have turned into some sort of a retail supply chain expert. I've never studied it in school. Um, you know, so, so why? And that's what I want to talk a little bit about, the idea that as an entrepreneur, you really are engaging in learning through this arc 
um, across you know, companies and across your career. And as you learn more and more, you're able to try to solve more and more problems. You know, in the beet farm, it was hoe and sugar beets and robots. And then in college, and for some of you, you've probably, I, I've probably seen a thousand <coughs> college students try to, try to solve the problem of parking, right, or, or calendaring. It's because it's the problems you know. So how did I get to this spot? Well, family friend, you know, a friend of mine from high school, Mike Masoner from Burley, Idaho, would buy closeout skis from manufacturers, Rosignol K2, and then they would go to ski swaps. Now they'd buy these skis in the spring, they would put them in 55 gallon garbage pails, stuff them full of skis, put them up in the back of a horse trailer, and they'd drive to Park City, they would drive to Los Angeles, they'd go to Portland, Oregon, and they would sell skis at these ski swaps. And you know, I'm a student at BYU, um, and I'm like, man, I wanna do this, this business, that sounds kinda interesting. But I was in the machine, I was at school, you know, I'd started in computer science, I got kind of bored with, or, you know, somehow I got out of technology, went into accounting so that I could eventually get an MBA, because you never major in business if you want an MBA. <coughs> went and did an audit internship for Arthur Anderson. Um, you know, it was, it was good, ranked in my program, had kind of picked the letter. Went to Los Angeles, and about 30 seconds after my first day working with these, you know, senior auditors, I was like, you know, if I have to do audit, I literally will probably end my life. Um, <laughs> So I stuck through, luckily it was a short internship, it was only like, like nine weeks. Um, came back, go to BYU, I said, I wanna change my major. They say, you can't change your major, you're too close to graduation. You know, BYU has a supply demand problem, I understand. I said, fine, I'm gonna drop out of school then. And that's what I did. And I think, you know, my family and, and you know, my, my, my future wife's family at the time were kinda like, man, you're gonna marry a bum that doesn't have a job and he just dropped out of school. Um, but it gave me the impetus to do this thing that I've been thinking about for a while, so ski trade. So ski swap online, why, why are they taking garbage, you know, garbage pails to ski swaps? So I didn't know anything about ski swaps. Started you know, putting flyers up at BYU. Buy skis, I asked, call me for skis. People would call me and be like, uh, I, don't, I don't really have any skis, but what kind of skis do you want? You know, like, and, I'd, and then I'd call and try to find up skis because I, I was trying to learn. And I went to the Scoutorama down at, at the time, Utah Valley State University, and I just walked up to strangers and like, hey, how, where do you buy your gear? Do you need better deals on gear? And then I flew to North Carolina and basically crashed this little industry enclave for the Outdoor Industry Association. I wasn't invited, and it was an invite-only thing. I just showed up, they let me in. I met all these industry reps, and I learned more and more. And so this idea of ski trade, this is the logo that I designed that. It's my most proud logo. That's, that's Microsoft Word right there. <laughs> Best logo you'll ever see. Um, it got bigger, we called it Burley Zone. You know, because it's not just skis. No, it's, you know, we realized real quick, it's not just skis, it's mountain bikes, so then we, we had MTB trade, and we had gear trade, and paddle trade, uh, and mountain trade, you know, we had these different kind of vertical things, and we said, let's go do this ski swap. And as we started working into that industry, we started running into specialty retailers and people like my you know, friend from Idaho, dealing with closeouts. You know, so you think what I first started with, inventory distortion, inventory that has been overstocked. They bought too much of it. So I don't know, have you ever gone to a, a specialty type retailer and seen 40% off? Like, that's them saying, I bought too much, I gotta get rid of this crap, free up some of my money so that I can buy more stuff. So we started learning in Burley Zone and then we realized you know, Burley Zone is kinda, uh, you know, kind of cool, but gear trade was the one. So we got it to gear trade. And we raised some money um, from family friends, my family, my co-founder's family, mostly family friends, a few angel investors, about $220,000. And we were, we were on our way, like, you're gonna build a business. And we you know, hired a few interns, a couple employees, and uh, you know, work for a year and actually see some pretty cool stuff. And then the dot-com crash happened. Some of you, I mean, that was, this was a, years ago, but 1999, 2000, you know, this was the, the huge debacle of all these massive tech companies that had raised hundreds of millions of dollars and they all just went away like in a month. So there's, there's, you know, we thought we had enough traction to raise some more money, but uh, you know, other people didn't. We laid everybody off. Two of us worked for another year for free. Um, was able to sell the assets, uh, try to get some upside for our investors, uh, but get out of the computer leases and the credit cards. Um, you know, it was about $155,000 of things that I had personally signed on. Um, you know, we, we, we put it into a place where hopefully, hopefully could still go. 
and if things went well, we'd get something. It didn't really go well, and it ended up the, the guys that own backcountry.com bought it. And it still exists. And as an entrepreneur, that's really cool, because this thing I created from nothing. You know, I wanted to be an inventor. I invented something, me and other people. Um, and uh, we didn't, didn't get anything for it, but I can still go put my gear up, and when I get the gear trade check in the mail, that's kind of cool. Um, and it's right at the end of that gear trade, you know, it's closeouts, you know, right, overstock inventory, specialty retailers. There was a distributor in Salt Lake City called Liberty Mountain, and they said, you know, what we really need help with is drop shipping, not closeouts. I'm like, okay, what's drop shipping? Never heard of that before. It's like, oh, well, I'm a distributor, I have all this stuff. All of these new e-commerce retailers, they want me to hold the inventory and ship it for them. And I, and I remember this light bulb went off and I said, you know, if you could do that everywhere, the retailer would no longer have a closeout inventory problem because he's never buying any inventory. It's inventory free retail. He only deals, he never touches it and he only deals with inventory in a virtual world when a consumer raises his hand and say, I want to buy it. So then the day we did the asset sell for, for gear trade, we incorporated a new company. It was called Secure Offer. Probably doesn't sound like a company trying to go do e-commerce and drop shipping, because it wasn't. Because, you know, my wife Amy at the time basically said, you've worked for free for a year, you're a bum. You can't work for free anymore. So we knew enough about search engine marketing and some SEO and some things. We started this little mini search engine marketing, email marketing lead generation company called Secure Offer. And I remember the first couple months, we actually made some decent money. I brought home like a big check, because we were just taking the money. Um, we didn't want to build that business. We wanted to build this drop shipping thing, but we needed money to fund the development. So we hired one of my co-founders at Gear Trade and my old fresh, or my freshman year roommate from BYU to start building this technology that we were going to call Wholesale Marketer. Um, and we were going to try to build this drop shipping service where we, can, we acted as this virtual distributor to all of these suppliers who have physical inventory and connect them and aggregate it together to these small online sellers. So about two months into it, we realized that we'd never make enough money to pay Dave. So then we just made him a co-founder and made him work for free. And uh, so we started Bill Wholesome Marketer. And it started to take off. And I call this the Rob Peter to pay Paul so that you can kill, Rob Peter to pay Paul so that you can kill Peter. You know, we never wanted to do this. We were making like 300 grand a year doing this SEO lead stuff, but it was always a means to an end. And the minute that this started to go, 30 days we gave all of our partners notice we shut it down because it's just a distraction. That may be your day job. You work another job while you start your company so that you can kill your other job. Like That's this kind of time shift. Very, very common for entrepreneurship. Wholesale marketer eventually turned into Dobu because we realized the brand was horrible because no one could get it right. Wholesale marketers, wholesale marketeering, kind of sounds like racketeering. Um, wholesaler, wholesales, it was a horrible thing. Uh, so Doba, you know, we, we're this product broker. We, we were at the right place at the right time. Uh, the world needed what we had kind of poked on. eBay was a big new force in the world, democratizing and letting anyone sell online. Um, and our company, without any investor capital, we, we grew 3,300 something percent in four years. So two, you know, two or three of us crawling through a basement window um, through the, you know, d down in, you know, through the window well so that we didn't wake up my, you know, my co-founder's family when we were coming into work, you know, and four years later we had almost 100 employees, um, you know, from basically zero to almost, you know, $9 million. And, and, and that, the nothing that we did, and that's one of the other, you know, lessons, you know, rob Peter, pay Paul to kill Peter, good idea. Other one, any success you have is going to have some amount of luck. You, call it, you can call it luck, you can call it blessings, you can call it karma, you can call it you know, any of those things. It, 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 it's gonna have to happen. And if you ever find an entrepreneur who doesn't admit that that played a decent role in their success, you should dr drastically run the other direction and don't give credence to a single word that they say because they believe they did it. And sometimes there's a piece of that, but you have to be in the right place at the right time, but you have to be there. You know, my, A favorite quote of mine, Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. You gotta go, you gotta take action. Sometimes you get a little lucky, sometimes you don't. So Doba, you know, took off, good company, uh, but, but you know, didn't really do what I thought we could because the business model, different things. And we started talking to retailers. We started talking to the suppliers. And you know, our model was this kind of product broker. We're in the middle, we're matchmaking. And it's a hard thing. It's chicken and egg marketplace to try to scale. And, I, and we started to realize, wait a minute, to make Doba work, 
We've had to integrate with 500 vendors and 2 million product SKUs. Those integrations are really hard. And you know what, they're not just hard for us, they're hard for everyone. Like, and everyone we talk to is basically just doing all of this manual work to do these integrations. And, and we said, that, that could be maybe a better way. Then this is a dropship commerce. We said, let's make it a better way. So what does dropship commerce do? Who knows Amazon.com? Okay, who's bought something from Amazon.com? Did you know there's two businesses at Amazon? Very discreet businesses? Let me show you. So this is a year old because they haven't reported Q4 yet from just this Q4. 26 billion in revenue. You know, the, the percentages would be the same, but 26 billion in Q4 2013. But there's a term called GMV, gross merchandise volume. That's how much stuff Amazon moved. Well, that number for the same time period is 47 billion. Why are those different? Why is Amazon moving more products than they're counting as revenue? Does anybody know? Yeah. Yeah, they're like a marketplace. Basically, yeah. 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 Well, actually, we'll zoom in on that. Did my mic go? They're a retailer, like any other retailer. If you look at it, you know, they've got a you know physical. You know, it's a, the first, the, the the second e-commerce slide, right? They have a B a B process with a physical stock room, right? Amazon stock room is 60, in the US, 67 warehouses, 51 million square feet. And I need to check my notes. Do you know how much a million square feet is? How many acres? 23. So Amazon has 1,173 acres of stock room full of stuff, okay? It's, it's uh, if you wanna go, it's 867 football fields, okay? Um, it's worth about seven and a half billion dollars wholesale sitting in places. Um, that part of their business in here was $23 billion of the GMV. The other part of their business they call marketplace. Amazon allows over two million other people to sell on Amazon. So there are other retailers, there are manufacturers, there, there are other people who have stuff. So it's, it's a stock room, but it's distributed, you know, it's, it's everywhere. We, no way to know how many square feet of a stock room that is. And I don't know what kind of billions of dollars. Um, but I would guess that it's probably, you know, I mean, more of what Amazon sells is, is in this. And this is growing faster. It's growing almost twice as fast as this. Um, the reason the discrepancy in the revenue, when Amazon sells $25 billion here, they only count about $2.5 billion as revenue. Because see, they're just the marketplace. It's pure profit. They allow someone else to deal with the inventory. They get the customer. They take the order. They take 10%. There's no cost of goods sold. There's no inventory fees. So it deflates their revenue. But their impact in the world is far bigger than most people think because of this thing. So how do they do this? Well, Amazon needs to see all of those two million sellers, right? Well, they, they built technology in a thing called Amazon Seller Central so that they can get the product data, virtual data about physical products, pictures, descriptions, categories, attributes, size, weight, you know, so that they can get inventory. How many of these shoes are there and where are they? And that they can do an order. Oh, I sold one of your shoes. Here's the order, ship it to the customer, tell me what you did. Drop, you know, it's basically drop shipping. They call it marketplace, same as drop shipping. So what we do is we do integration and automation software and technology to exchange product information, inventory information, and order information with hundreds of suppliers and hundreds of retailers to try to make it easier to do these integrations. Because the world today generally is, you know, Motang has to build integrations to all of those people and more. You know, Overstock does this, you know, back and forth. It's this many-to-many -many ad hoc integration world. We're trying to get people tools to do one-to-many. So that's what Dropship Commerce does. Uh, small team, around 10 people. We've raised a few million, uh, handfuls of millions of dollars from investors. And I could tell you probably by the end of the year if we're going to make it or not. I give us, eh, I don't know, 50-50 chance. Um, we've been working on it for three years. I think we've almost exhausted 
the number of things that we could do wrong or that we don't want to do. It's almost gone. Now we might find we figured out. And that's how most startups are. Very few overnight success stories. You hear about them and they seem that way. Most entrepreneurs put six, seven years of their life into it before they actually figured it out and tipped it. Um, so I want to shift real quick. Massive disruption, you know, all of these, these trends that are happening. Um, you know, I'm living a piece of that inside of e-commerce and retail supply chain. Um, but I, I, you know, this is one of my favorite pitches about entrepreneurship. It, it's, a, you know, it's called defying gravity. It's, in, it's impossible, right? You can't do that. That's what entrepreneurship is. You have to do the impossible. Um, and I think that today, 2015 is so awesome. Uh, and, the, and the things and tools that you have at your disposal and the potential that you have in the world to do just amazing things has never been greater. And I think it's getting better and better every passing day. Um, and the way I think about it is this idea of, of magnitude. See, you know, magnitude, an order of magnitude, right? 10, 100, 1,000, and so on and so forth. Put a zero after something. A little experiment. There's our planets. Really see those good? Earth, you know, it's uh, cool, we're big. Oh, wait, no, we're not. Oh, now we're here. Jupiter's, oh, wait, there's the sun. Now we're there. These magnitude, right? Just, just I'm trying to think about scale. This is a extreme scale change. There's the sun, Earth goes invisible when you put the Ar Arcturus sun. And it's not even, you know, Antares. At that level, the sun is one pixel. Hey, the sun was huge. Look at, look at the sun compared to Earth, it's huge. You know, the scale of the world. Um, so hopefully this works, but it might not. Because my, if, you, if we don't have audio. Have you ever borrowed a book from thousands of miles away? the country without stopping for directions or send someone a fax from the beach you will and the company that will bring it to you AT&T AT&T have you ever paid a toll without slowing down So I love that. This is 1993, so 22 years ago. And I think they got, like, like Skype was, or sorry, not Skype, uh, Netflix. It's like spot on, right? Like, but send a fax from the beach, right? They didn't see email, right? They, they, they used what they knew, faxes, and made it mobile. They didn't see email. The, 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 the one through the toll, right? They didn't see RFID chips in my car that the sensors in, in, the, in the carpool lane read. So as you went through the toll, you had to swipe your credit, right? Like, so, so they were kind of close. But, but, you know, they got a few things. And, and uh, what are we living in the future? It's 2015, this year Back to the Future 2 happens, right? Like, this, we've, we've caught up to the future finally. Um, <laughs> this is my first computer. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm going to give you the stats quick. And I, I know we kind of got a late start. Do we have to be done right? We have a, a little latitude? Okay. 
Okay, this is a 1988. First of all, who in here wasn't born in 1993 when ATT was predicting the future? Okay, I just want to get a lay of the land how old I am. You know, my, Caitlin and Alex call me old man, so. Um, this is a Franklin PC-8000. I'm getting a little technical, but I'll hopefully it'll make sense. Intel 8088 processor, 4.77 megahertz. Had an 8-bit an eight bit processor, okay? Um, 4,500 transistors. That's how much, you know, silicon stuff they did on it. Uh, 512K kilobytes of RAM, 640K floppies. It had a 20 megabyte hard drive and was one of the very first computers that you could buy as a consumer that actually even came with a hard drive. And one way to measure, it's, it's, it's actually starting to break um, because the way uh, architecture happens these days, but, but one way to measure processing power of a computer is millions of instructions per second. You know, it's, in essence, it's like, it's like the RPMs of, of the computer and you know, the, the processor and the memory and the buses and all that stuff. Okay, um, ready? I, I don't have the iPhone 6, I have the iPhone 5. This is the iPhone 6. Um, so that's 26 years later. Okay, so you guys are all gonna be, live 100 easy with medical events. So it's a fourth of your lifespan. This is what's happened. This is an Apple A8 processor at 1.4 gigahertz. So just the speed of the processor clock, you know, giga is, is 250 times faster. You think that's a big number, but it, okay. So um, the, it's not 8-bit, it's 64-bit, and it has, it's a quad-core processor. I don't even think they had the idea of a core before. It was just, it was a processor. So um, remember how many transistors this guy had? 4,500. Do you know how many transistors? Who has an iPhone 6? Do you know how many transistors your thing has? Three billion. It's a 666,666. I'm, I'm not trying to do the whole mark of the beast. That was the math. Um, times increase in transistors in 26 years. Uh, a gigabyte of, of RAM, that's a 2,000 times increase in memory. Um, it's 128 gigs at the high level compared to 20 megabytes. So that's a, that's a uh, 6,400 times increase in storage. That first computer that I had, that we had down in our basement, if you put four to five iTunes songs, it was full. <laughs> so, because if you're not very technical, I'll put in perspective. Maybe six, six iTunes songs, error hard drive full. I mean, I have like 7,000 songs on here. I have more room than I want to do with. Um, so, you know, the, the MIPS, millions of instructions per second, my first computer was two million instructions per second. Um, the iPhone 6 can do 25,000 million instructions per second. So it's a 12,000 times increase in rough processing power. Um, plus, it has video and GPS and accelerometers and full spectrum of, of connectivity and telephony chipsets. Um, it's got a compass. The new ones can do temperature and heart rate and you know. So the first supercomputer, I, I tell people all the time, yeah, I walk around with a supercomputer in my pocket and they look at me like, what are you talking about? It's not, I'm not trying to be funny, I'm telling the truth. Um, the first Cray supercomputer um, back in the 70s, um, sorry, 1985, I, right. 1985 could do 150 MIPS. 150 MIPS. This can do 25,000 MIPS. So it's 136 times faster than the world's first supercomputer. Um, anyway. So then, you know, again, it replaced, you know, you know my dad had one of those, a backpack VCR camcorder. A backpack with a camcorder and it would record to a V, you know, right? Um, a Walkman. I think so. I saw Sony has a new Walkman coming, but it's like a thousand bucks. I'm like, what are you putting on that thing? Um, you know, cameras. Uh, anybody even know what this is? <laughs> Does any like truly the ones of you who raised your hand that weren't around in '93? Do you know what this is? World Book, encyclopedias. Okay, good. <laughs> Ten years, nobody will. Um, what is this today? Wikipedia. It's in your pocket. Supercomputer. Uh, that's the, one of the first GPS units for consumers. 
that's one of the first cell phones that you had to like hook them up in your car because it needed enough power. You know, you can, um, you know, cell phones. And it's all in this thing. And we carry it around in our pocket every day. And that happened in 20, 26 years. What about the next 26 years? Like, or the ne I mean, you know, think about that for a second. So um, a few other kind of crazy things. That's a picture of the first room that they used to sequence the human genome. All of a human's genes. Um, it took them 13 years, and it cost government and science $2.7 billion to get one human genome. Um, those are some pictures of, uh, sorry, those are some pictures of machines that can do it now for a thousand bucks. Um, they say that probably within five years it's a hundred bucks. You know, another five years after that, when you have a baby, they'll just take its genome because it's going to cost fifteen dollars, and you're going to go to the pharmacy and they're not going to give you a meprazole for your heartburn like I take. They're going to give you a specific version of it because they've got enough data to know that you need this one versus this one. Um, that's the, that's the, the, the drop in the price of sequencing the human genome. Um, this is an industrial uh, device. It's a 3D printer. Um, you know, they've been around for a long time. Additive manufacturing. Instead of taking like a sheet of aluminum or a you know, and cutting it away, you start with nothing but air and you build up from it. Um, I just was at the Consumer Electronics Show. I, I can't even, I can't even hardly fathom um, some of the stuff that they're coming. Uh, and it's, you know, they, they had one printing food from a printer, like, a, like an inkjet printer. Um, so this is the, uh, the world's fastest computer. Um, it's the IBM Sequoia. It does 16.32 petaflops. So they've gone away from MIPS because it didn't even work anymore. It's, it's one quadrillion floating point operations per second, kind of like instructions per second. You know, so you know, they, they got into this quadrillion. It has 96 racks, 98,304 nodes, and it has 1.6 million computing cores. Basically, that machine, um, the speed of the number one supercomputer in the world, I, I've given these slides now for three, four years. I always have to go update it. The speed of the fastest supercomputer in the world doubles every 13.2 months. So this one does 16.32 petaflops. That means a year and a month and two, you know, or you know, a year and a month and uh, 10 days from now, the new one's going to be doing 32 petaflops and then 64. And then, I mean, that's what's happening in this crazy world. Um, so they think that by 2019, you'll be able to do one million trillion calculations, which is a quintillion per second. They think that's when one of these supercomputers would roughly, equivalent, roughly be equivalent to the processing of, of a single human brain. Um, and I'm not trying to tell you that the machines are going to take over all. That's a whole other conversation. Um, but magnitude change, like when you're putting zeros after things, you know, when you're looking at planets that look big but then they're really tiny, and when you're looking at the kinds of change that's happening in our world and in our society and for all of us as humans and how fast it's happening, it's, it's orders of magnitude change and it seems to kind of be accelerating and the disruption. And what that means for people who like to solve problems and complain and invent things, it's like, awesome opportunities and, and kind of chaos. And inside of chaos, it's where you can do some amazing things. Um, and so one last thing around, my, you know, we talked about music. Um, so vinyl records was the dominant form of music for 40 years. Um, you know, people used to keep phones like, like 20 years. I, who, who went and got the iPhone 6 right when it came out? Raise your hand. Why? You have a supercomputer, you know, from tw 20 years ago, the iPhone 5, it's 137 times more powerful than a su supercomputer from, you know, why'd you buy a new one? Because, you know, if you wait one or two cycles, they don't, they don't do what we want. They don't, I mean, it's that kind of change where, you know, the, these things are out of date within a year or two or three. Um, you know, so people kept their phones for 20 years. Uh, 
Some other perspective, radio, it took radio 38 years to get to 50 million subscribers, 50 million users. TV was 13, the web was four, iPod was three, Facebook was two, the iPad was a year and a half. And what I find so interesting to that is not the fact that it went from, you know, 38 years to a year and a half to get to this 50, 50 million number, but because they're thinking radio to start and then they go forward, they use 50 million as the denominator in a world where Facebook has like 2 billion profiles. You know, it's just, and, and, and I looked up, you know, Apple sells like 30 million iPhones every three months. You know, so it's funny to think about, you know, when they're ana analyzing how fast the world is moving, they're using the wrong metric. It shouldn't be how fast to get to 50 million, it should be how fast to get to a billion. Um, and with this opportunity, I get really excited and I hope that you get excited to go be an entrepreneur. And, you know, I think Nike has the best slogan for entrepreneurs that's ever been invented. Because entrepreneurship is about doing things. You know, in, in the, it's the, the dinner that we had in the sessions, I would ask people, are you an entrepreneur, yes or no? And it's, well, you know, and it's about, more about kind of who you are and if you want to invent something, create something from nothing, and, and go and, and make, a, make a difference in the world by doing those, by solving a problem. You can do it inside of companies too. You know, it doesn't have to be corporate or it doesn't have to be, you know, create entities. Didn't exist, I founded something that fixed it, that did it, you can do all those things. And that's exciting. But the key is you just have to do it. Um, and I've seen a lot of people over the years who always are talking about being entrepreneurs and they just don't do it. And that's the, that's the key, is you have to go, you have to take action. And really, you know, you do what this guy is, right? It's about beating your head on a brick wall. And if you get a little bit lucky, somehow a brick wall that shouldn't be able to be broken with your mere, you know, noggin can get broken. And, and you, can, you can do some really awesome, fun stuff. Um, so I, I want to do some questions. Um, and uh, before we do questions, that's my information. It, you know, Twitter, cell phone, email. I love to talk to other people who are, who are entrepreneurs or who are thinking about being entrepreneurs or, or trying to be entrepreneurs. Um, I may talk you out of it or try to talk you out of it because there's, there's really good highs and there's really lows. But uh, I love it and it helps me keep, keep ideas. It gets me energized. So we can do some questions. Okay. And I have one last thing at the end. It's a, 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 a particip participant. I don't even know the word, participatory activity, why we're eating ice cream. So, um, who has any questions? Yeah. When you talk about risk is necessary part of being an entrepreneur, what ways did you find through all your experiences in dealing or helping communicate that risk? Or that may not stress, but the risk rather. Um, not, like, not stress out over the risk or minimize it. Um, I actually don't think you, you, you can really minimize the risk because it's an unknown quantity. That's what's so hard about an entrepreneurship is there's, there's nothing that's known. Everything is a variable. Um, it's really hard to, you know, to do an experiment when there are no known constants. Um, I, think, I think most entrepreneurs that actually go do it kind of are hardwired in their brain the wrong way to think about risk compared to most of society. Uh, it's probably the right way for them, but they, they just don't approach it the same way. And, and I think when you're trying to, to start something and found something and, and solve a problem, if you start with a, I need to minimize my risk in this, but you, you're, you're, not, you're not committed enough. You know, you're, it's the wrong framework of mind. Uh, you, you, you either need to, if you think that way, set it aside or just be lucky like me and never even think twice about asking your parents to dump $10,000 into gear trade because somehow my brain just never even thought about it. It's just, of course you would do that. That's, that's, we're going to go do this thing, you know? So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I think you're either one way or the other, and if you're the one way, you're a really good candidate to be an entrepreneur. If you're the other, you're going to fight that pretty hard. And it comes up all the time. You can't, you can't risk manage when there's too, there's too many variables. Just go. Leap. Jump. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a fine line. I about got reckless. Um, we had 
you know, uh, you know, the dot com crash happened, we couldn't raise money. Um, we were gonna try to save, you know, keep gear trade going. We were just so close. It was, it was right there, you know. So, you know, my dad, you know, I said, Dad, I need some money, and they won't loan me the money from the bank. And I know the investors are all watching their portfolios get destroyed. So, um, but the the bank, you know, um, said they'll do an SBA loan, but we need collateral. So that farm picture from the front, you know, became the collateral. Um, and I think, didn't you, you'd signed the paperwork, didn't you? You went to D11's bank and had signed that your side, and I was going to, that morning, I was headed down to Capital Community Bank in Orem to go sign, and we were going to borrow $150,000. With hindsight, we would have not succeeded. We were farther than we thought. We would have lost that money, and then I'd probably try to, I don't know, I'd work four jobs to pay back my dad's farm, right? So um, <coughs> my co-founder, you know, so reckless, right? You need, you need peers and friends and mentors that know enough, that they're far enough away from you to have perspective, but they're close enough away to have perspective, if that makes sense. They know, you know, they know. And, and, uh, and Chris uh, Knutson, who helped me start Gear Trade, he came into my office that morning and he's like, Jeremy, I didn't sleep at all last night. You can't do this. I slept like a baby. I, I don't know, that's why I think I'm, I think I'm deficient. Because I was gonna risk my dad's farm that he paid off, you know, worked his whole life and owned his farm for years and years. I, I didn't even think about it because I had to, this thing had to go. Um, and, uh, you know, Chris, you know, sees Chris, Chris is more, you know, he's, he had the perspective. And, and when he said that, like in 10 seconds, I was like, oh my gosh. It was almost like I pulled myself out of this, like, like you know, twilight zone that I was living in. And I called the bank, it's like, deal's off. And we didn't do it. <coughs> Laid the employees off like a week later. And so the only way to have, you, as an entrepreneur, especially if you're wired the, maybe the right or the wrong way on risk, you have to have some peers. You know, I, I like a peer group as much as I like mentors who are more experienced, that we're all living the same battles, you know. Um, you know, some peers and some, and some mentors and friends and people that know you enough and know enough about what's going on, but they're distanced enough to tell you the right, you know, the right advice. And that will tell you straight to your face, like kind of brutal hard truths. That's, that's how I've tried to do it. I got lucky. Because that was like, it was like three hours away, you know, from that, so. Yeah. Um, for, for someone that's starting something as, as you were in, in, your, in your spot on the farm, um, obviously this, you wouldn't be who you are without your family today. I'm sure that, that you owe a great deal of your success to them. Um, was it trouble getting them on board with what you were doing, especially your wife and your parents? <laughs> were there any troubles, and how did you overcome those to help them understand the same vision that you have in your daily and, and, and goals? And like yeah, that? so, so two, there's two answers. So with, 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 uh, with my mom and dad, I, I, my mom used to tell people I probably sold drugs on the Internet because um, <laughs> she, you know, didn't understand what we were doing. So I, you know... Um, so like with gear trade, you know, that's where, you know, the difference between, an, uh, you know, an investor, you know, and family, that's why a lot of people say, you know, you need people, families, they, they don't invest from a financial standpoint, they invest from a, a standpoint of love, you know, like friends, you know, and, and, you know, a lot of times as first time entrepreneurs, that's the card you have to play, right? If you don't have people who care about you and love you or like you, you're kind of screwed. Um, so if you're not a likable person, I don't, I don't know what to tell you, you're, you know, you're going <laughs> to... You know, good luck, right? So, um, you know, so, so I think, you know, some amount of it was just I, I kind of live in a world that, that's foreign, you know, at least with, with my mom and dad. But, but, you know, back to the gear trade thing, it was, they did it because I, I kind of steamrolled them and, you know, things. And, um, you know, but with, with Amy, I, it's, I got lucky that, again, you know, um, I, I married somebody who, who has been able to adapt and learn. And, I mean, I really wasn't an entrepreneur when we got married. I was an unemployed dropout of school, <laughs> different. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, but you know, Amy worked, and she worked jobs, and, and I worked a night job at Authorized Net while I was starting gear trade from three to midnight, getting Rob Peter to pay Paul, so I could, Peter, so I could work on gear trade from eight to two, and I could work, and she brought me dinner, you know. So there was a huge amount of support, and it, it's true, if, if you don't have that you know, from your family and friends, you know, if you're, if you're an unlikable person and you marry the wrong person, 
uh, you know, just just go get a job doing audit internships with Arthur Anderson, and and, uh, and make it work, right? Uh, so it's it's really important, um, and I've had to learn like how much do I, you know, I, you know, do I come home and say, you know what, company might fail, you know, uh, or do I kind of keep some things close to the vest? And, yeah, I, there's certain things you want to internalize and just bury them deep. Yeah. Ah, see, I didn't have a really financial job because I tried that and I hated it. I'd have rather, I'd have rather like just been a bum than go do that. Or I, truly, I would have rather go and work at Walmart as a greeter than go back and do audit internships and you know stuff. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so, so uh, you know, I I think that's I think that might be part of you know uh, growing up on a farm. It's crazy how many entrepreneurs I meet that grew up on farms. And and one of the sad things I think is it it's an environment where you learn some important life lessons, right? Risk reward. You know, does dad buy does dad buy hail insurance this year? Yes or no? I don't know. Didn't buy it. Hail destroys the beans. Okay, get it. You know, work hard. You know, you reap what you yeah. sow. Like. I mean, right? Like that's so critical to this, you know, like, like scrappiness and I mean, another favorite quote of mine is the key to success is, is largely a matter of who can hold on the longest. And if you've ever, who grew up on a farm? Okay, isn't farming kind of like holding on the longest? Like especially smaller family farms, that's what it is. And it's, I get, I, I get sad by that because it's kind of all gone. Like there's not gonna, if I came back here to USU in 25 years and I asked who grew up on a farm, there's going to be a tiny fraction because it's all just, and so then how are we going to train, you know, that's a training, it's a training, it's a, it's a refiner's fire that's been kicking out successful people for a long time that's going away. But it is, it's very important to, to, to you know, that I give yeah, credit to the, to the, you know, the farm kind of work life. But I, if you, I'm not sad that I build software instead of milk cows, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's good. It, it's helped. Um, you know, if you're really, if you want to be an entrepreneur, I think you should look at your, your experience in college because you're, you're learning a base set of information. You're learning, you're learning business skills and business information. But you look at college and like being, being able to make you an entrepreneur, right? It's a supplementary thing. So it's helped. Um, you definitely have that. But at the same time, uh, is, is anyone in here going to be an auditor or, or is an auditor? I don't want to like, you know, you love it. That's awesome, but it wasn't for me. Um, at the same time, like you think about like, like finances. Like, you know, I learned the gap accounting. I took 24 credit hours of accounting. And I know a little bit about that. Um, almost very little of that in early phase startup supplies because there's nothing that's known. You don't have to know how to do revenue recognition. You don't have any revenue, right? So it's, but it's a good foundation. And I do find entrepreneurs that because they don't understand that world, you have to do it. You, and you know, and, and once, so in the early, early days, it's kind of not as important. But if things start to go, some of those skills are, are actually really important. I, I like that I, I, know, I, know, I, I took a lot of business classes and I learned some basic, you know, good, good basic solid stuff there. The accounting background has been very helpful. I, I was a computer science major. I started programming computers when I was like seventh grade, you know, all through high school. And then I took, I took a year or a year and a half at BYU. So I don't code anymore and there's so much that I don't know. But I have some sense of what it takes to actually build code so I'm not talking to my engineers and some crazy world, you know, so learning those sets of skills I think are really important. One more question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and just to clarify, the ski trade wasn't getting the word out, right? That's me, I was learning the market. It was market validation, it was lean startup, you know, like, I, I just, I, I never sold any skis. I just wanted to try to talk to people who would be, who would respond to, I want to buy use or close out skis so I could learn, you know. So, so um, you know, 
so that was that. With Gear Trade, to get the word out, we partnered with other companies. So we would go to like Skier Magazine or Backpacker Magazine, and we would say, hey, use our technology, put your logo on it, and say powered by Gear Trade, and we'll run this gear swap for your community, because you have 700,000 subscribers. Uh, for Doba, we, you know, with, with, with our first, you know, Rob Peter to pay Paul that we were gonna kill, uh, we learned a lot about email marketing and search marketing. It, it was brand new. Goto.com, who had just invented pay-per-click advertising, was like brand new. And I went in like, this is, this is awesome. And I started learning how to do it. And so we learned that a little bit. And then we got right in front of this huge demand around, I don't know where to get a product to, dr to put into my eBay store. And furthermore, I want to drop ship it because I don't want to buy it and put it in my garage. So a lot of that was driven by this, this inflection point like two inflection points. One, on the product side, um, you know, we were at the right place when huge numbers of people were deciding to become a merchant, a retailer, but these little eBay sellers. And we were at the inflection point of an innovation, paid search marketing that allowed us to stick our solution in front of them. Um, and then with Dropship, we, we, we bought the domain dropship.com and we basically just sit back and let people call us. So, um, although, you know, back to we finally maybe have figured all of the things what we don't want to do anymore. That's probably the one thing I would change, even though it is that because we have been too reactionary. We haven't been proactive enough, and so we're working on, on some of those things. But um, so that, those were my first three. A lot of it circles around you know search, you know finding out where are they get, and it doesn't have to be Google and stuff. Like if you're running any kind of business, like. Who might want to buy my stuff, my product, my solution, and where do they like to hang out? That's that's the question that, that you kind of get to, I think, with that. So, um, okay, last thing, quick. I have this thing. So, who's an entrepreneur? So, I call it my Declaration of Entrepreneurship, A.K.A. the Declaration of Independence. You know, um, this is this is like rubber on the road, right? Like, you got to commit. Sign your name, I have all kinds of cool Sharpie colors. I have another sign up sheet, you give me your name and your email, and 10 years from now, so use an email that will stick. You get an email from me. You said you were gonna be an entrepreneur. Did you really go do it, yes or no? And if you say no, I'll probably start spamming you. Um, <laughs> you know, like start sending, start sending like daily messages, you suck. <laughs> No, I wouldn't do that. I would be more, mo I would send the message that's down here in the hall from, from, from T. Rose, Teddy Roosevelt. You know, dare mighty things. I'd try to convince you to do it. So, uh, maybe we'll put it here on the table. I've got, you know, sign it, put your name and email on the peep thing, and then we have ice cream stuff. And, you know, add to, these are, these are from four or five years from BYU and Utah State and everywhere. So, thank you for letting me come. Thank you. Good